480 on the first verse. Here we go. Sweetly slow. I can't hear the piano. Sweetly, Lord, have you heard me all? Come follow me. And we see where thy footprints fully lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that makes a pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where, where they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountain sea, King his sheep, or along by Siloam's fountain, helping the wing. Footprints of Jesus and make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where, where they go. And verse 4. Then at last one on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the foot of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus and may the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. If you grab your Bible this morning, stay standing here a little bit. Turn to Philippians 4. <clears throat> Philippians 4, reading verses 6 and 7. Someplace along the line, I have this highlighted in my Bible. Right, wrong, or otherwise, Pastor. In verse 6, we're going to start in verse 6. It says, be careful for nothing, okay? And I have worry wrote underneath that. So, I don't know where it's going this morning, but underneath, be careful for nothing is, is what it is. So, Philippians 4, verse 6. And the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You may be seated. Let's turn our hymnal again to hymn number 94. 94. Names of Jesus. The name of Jesus is so sweet. I love its music to repeat. It makes my joys and complete the precious name of Jesus Jesus oh how sweet the name Jesus every day the same Jesus let all saints proclaim it's worthy praise forever for. No word of man can ever tell how sweet the name I love so well. Oh, let its praises ever swell. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Jesus 
us every day the same. Jesus, let all saints proclaim His worthy praise forever. Thank you. Pastor? We're in Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 30. Dave wondered where the morning service was going. He's right on target. So when you have that passage of scripture, if you're able, would you please stand? Luke 12, 22 through 30. Notice that he's directing this to his disciples. He had a parable before about a rich man who thought he was going to amass great possessions and uh, eat, drink, and be merry, and he talked about greed and covetousness. And now he turns specifically to his disciples, and they're sort of on the other end of the scale. The parable talked about a rich man. Most of these disciples were not in that category of being rich, but rather would be considered poor. Maybe probably not destitute, but on the poor end. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Father, I do pray that as the word of God is open, that you would talk to every one of us about our attitudes, our faith or lack thereof, our needs, how to address them in a way that honors you, in a way that is effective, pleasing, and brings glory to you. I pray that you'll just take over my thoughts, my words, that they'll not be my own, but yours through me. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A vast majority of the world is not rich. And more are tempted to worry about their needs being met than are tempted to amass even greater storehouses of abundance than they already have. Jesus addressed the problem of anxious care for the basic necessities of life when he spoke this to his disciples. And the thought here is that you should trust God to meet your earthly necessities instead of fretting about it. When it says to take no thought, 
we're going to address what that means in, in just a moment here. Um, we're going to look at the reasons that God gives to his disciples who didn't have many possessions for the most part. But as I said, we want to deal with this thought of taking no thought. There needs to be a clarification here. And it's the idea here in the Greek and in the context, it's evident as well, that this is an anxious thought, an anxiety, a fretful care about the things of uh, life, the basic necessities meeting our needs. One of the things that we have to clarify here is that Jesus was not saying we're not to labor and do our best, nor show prudent foresight, but he was saying not to have a needless, anxious care or worry and obsession about how our needs will be met. There's plenty in the scripture that indicates that we ought to do our due diligence within our abilities and, the, and within our opportunities to take care of our needs, but without anxious thought. For instance, Proverbs 6, 6 through 11 says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth in thy want as an armed man. So he says, Take uh, an example from nature where they don't have a boss like you and I, uh, somebody uh, constantly cracking the whip at them, and the ant will go and use diligence, work hard to gather in the season of the summer and uh, take care of it and harvest so through the winter months they have enough to eat. And he said, if you're slothful, you're going to be in want. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So if you're not going to take care of yourself and those that belong to you and your family, he says you're denying the faith. You're worse than an unbeliever. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 for even when we were with you, the Apostle Paul writes, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. There were some that were evidently trying to get goods off of everybody else and not working. They sort of had the idea, well, Jesus is going to come soon. We don't need to work. And he says, well, if they're going to be that way, then the church shouldn't supply for them their food. They are supposed to be industrious. They are supposed to work. Philippians then, as we read this morning, verses uh, 6 and 7 of chapter 4, be careful for nothing. Don't be in anxious care. Don't be fretting about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what's going to happen as a result? Peace will come. Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So the thought that he's getting across is evident here that it's anxious care that he's talking about. Worry is the word that uh, he had written in his Bible reason we shouldn't is because fretting about needs results in negative results. Fretting about our needs brings about negative results. And the reason is, as we see in verse 23 here, life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. 
more valuable, more important. Just having life. And God gives the life. If God gives that which is more important, isn't he going to take care of those things to take care of that life? You see, but what worry does is it flips the overriding importance of life over material needs. It inverts those things. It reverses those things. It makes the material aspect more important than life. And the Lord said life is more important than the material things. And worry forgets the obvious inferiority of creatures with met needs. Look at verse 24. Consider the ravens. By the way, the ravens were considered an unclean bird, but God used them on occasion, like when he fed Elijah with the ravens. But they were an unclean bird, and yet they don't have any means of storing up like the rich man that built barns and whatnot. They didn't have storehouses like that. And he says, your father feeds them. God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? They're inferior to you by a long shot. And look, their needs have already been met and are being met by God. Now, if God's going to take care, of your, take care of the inferior things of nature, isn't he going to take care of those things that he puts the most value in? And what is the most valued creation of the Lord? Mankind. Only man is made in God's image. Only man is made to have that kind of relationship with God. If he's going to take care of the rest of the creation... He's surely going to take care of his most important creation. And worry faces the overall impotence of man to meet life's main needs. Verses 25 and 26. And which of you, with taking thought, can, and the thought here, again, is this anxious thought. Which of you, by anxiety, if you will, can add to his stature one cubit. Now, stature can be used in more than one way. It can either talk about one's height or about the length of their life. And there's been debate among Bible scholars and readers which one should be used here. If you can't add to the days of your life, if you take it by that means, or if you can't add a cubit about 18, 18 and a half inches to your height through anxiety, which one's best? Well, personally, uh, I, I read a commentator that said it this way, and I have to agree. When it talks about a cubit, the cubit is never used, as far as I know, to talk about time. It's used to talk about measurement. So if you're using the word cubit here, it's probably to take it in the thought that you can't add any height to your measure by anxious thought. So he goes on to say, if you then be not able to do that which is least, why take you thought for the rest? If you can't do that little thing, then how are you going, why are you going to be anxious about all of the rest, meeting your needs? Let me try to give an illustration. Suppose a family is getting ready to go on vacation. And uh, typical family nowadays, you're loading up the car getting ready to go, right? And everybody's got their suitcases and snacks and whatever else you're going to take on this journey. And a child tries to pick up one of the suitcases and load it in the car. But the child is not able to even lift the suitcase. So they get the fretting about how they're going to get the suitcase in the car, and they can't figure out even how to get it in the car. It's just too big of a job 
for that child to do. And so then the father comes out and the child says, Daddy, where are we going to eat when we're on vacation? How are we going to pay for the food? Where are we going to sleep? Who's going to pay for it? And, and starts doing this. And the father says, hey, child, you can't even figure out how to get the suitcase in the car. How come you're worrying about these things? Let somebody who's capable take care of the job. I'm your daddy. I know how to get the suitcase in the car. I know how to make sure that we get fed and place to sleep. Leave that to me. God is saying, if you can't even take care of this matter, why are you worrying about all the rest? You're incompetent. You're incapable of taking care of those things. I'm the one that can take care of this. I'm the one in charge and can do it. Trust me. Ask God to help you identify the difference between sensible foresight and sinful anxiety. Yes, we are to use our minds to prepare to make sure our needs are met in a proper sense. God gives us the ability to think. He gives us the ability to work. He gives us the ability to save for the future. But sometimes we're anxious about that and we're not willing to admit it. It's not just using prudent foresight, it's worry. Uh, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, she's with the Lord now. And in the South, if you say, bless her little heart, it's all okay. Okay, so bless her little heart. She used to say, I'm not worried, I'm just concerned. I've tried that a few times too. You know, God has a way of pointing at it. What's the difference? Yeah, there is a proper concern, but sometimes we're using that as an excuse. We're really worried, aren't we? We need to ask God to help us identify the difference between prudent foresight in sinful anxieties. Confess anxiety is sin. And as we get to our next point, you're going to see even clearer why that is the case. And cast your care upon the Lord to take care of it. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. You cast all your anxious care upon him because he lovingly cares for you. And then Philippians 4, 6, and 8. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and what? The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall... Guard, keep your minds through Christ Jesus. Secondly, first was fretting about needs results in negative results. And secondly, faith in God recognizes the needlessness of worry. Faith in God recognizes the needlessness of worry. Here's the real problem of anxiety. It is not trusting God. Notice as we look at these verses, verse 24 and verses 27 through 28, consider the ravens, the ones that are inferior to us. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor, board, nor barn, and God feeds them. <laughs> that wasn't the King James Version, but it means the same thing, right? 
Also, verses 27 and 28, consider the lilies, how they grow. You see, the first one dealt with food. Now this one deals with clothing. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then, what? God so clothed the grass. God's doing this. Which is here today and tomorrow's cast in the oven. How much more will he clothe you? What does he say? O ye of little faith. Anxiety is a lack of trust in our loving, caring God. God will take care of the greater since he cares for the lesser. And notice verses 29 and 30. God will show compassion to his children since he comprehends their needs. Remember that child? Child couldn't even lift the suitcase into the car. They should have trusted their father to take care of the matters. Of providing for their journey because why? Because Father is able, not only physically, he has the capabilities financially, he has the capabilities intellectually to take care of these things, and he's willing. And he knows what needs to be taken care of. He says, your father knows you have need of these things. And father loves his children. Trust me, in other words, he's saying. Does that mean you'll never have pressing needs? No, that doesn't mean that at all just means when those times come, God is using them for his purposes and you can still trust him. View the challenges of your needs as God's channels to prove himself and glorify himself. Many times God puts us in situations so that he can show that God is in charge and he can do all things and we can trust him. Not only us, but the world around us then can see that God is real and he's the one to be trusted. Now, I wouldn't advise going and praying that God would put you in dire circumstances just so he can prove himself. Let God take care of when to do that kind of thing, you know. But do ask God to help you trust him in whatever circumstances he brings or allows to come into your life and that he will show himself powerful, show himself to be who he is for his glory in those circumstances. Again, confess anxiety as a sin of distrusting God. Ask God to help you know your responsibility and do it, and then leave the results up to him. Isn't that the hard part? People have asked me before, what do you do? I say, commit it to the Lord. Well, how do you do that? I, I committed it to the Lord, and I'm still having a problem with it. Recommit it. Or have you really committed it to the Lord? Have you really cast your burden on the Lord, or are you still holding on to it? We struggle with that, don't we? We need to ask God for help to be able to do even that. God, help us to trust you enough just to commit it to you. Now, help me to know what I ought to be doing. Should I go to work? Yeah. Aren't you glad to hear that, Don? She wants me to come to work. You can't find bus drivers. 
Is that God's will for me right now? Right now, yeah. Is that my responsibility then? Yeah. Be faithful. Hey, should I plan for the future? It depends on how I go about it, right? If I have an untrusting attitude about it, then, then I'm d doing it wrong. But if I'm trusting God to lead me and plan for the future, um, yeah, that's my responsibility. That's part of the stewardship that we were talking about, how to manage what God has put within my care. Lord, show me my responsibility and help me to take care of that. But where my responsibility ends and my just trusting you to take care of the results, help me to know the difference and, and then to do the right thing. Listen, God wants you to stop trying to run your own life and trust him to run it for his glory. Isn't that where it boils down to a lot of it? We're trying to run our own lives instead of trusting him to do it. Listen, it starts by turning your life over to him at salvation. When you repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ to save you from your sin and make you a child of God, his own disciple, that's where it all starts. If you're still going on in your own sinful unbelief, then you're still trying to run your own affairs. Repentance is turning from that and turning to Jesus. And then it continues with an every day, every moment trust in him. Ask yourself, is there some anxious care I need to turn over to him today? And then will you let go and trust him to take care of it today? Shall we pray? Father, I would think that most of us here fit into this category more than the ones who have great storehouses. We can be greedy, even it with little, but we're definitely more likely to be anxious. Help us to trust you, to take care of us. Help us to trust you that the way you take care of us and lead our lives is the right and best way. That you never make mistakes. That you love us too much to be unkind. And help us to know the difference of what our responsibility is and where we're to leave our hands off, let go, and let you run it. Pray that if there's a soul here that needs Jesus as Savior, that they'll start that relationship with you today. Guide us now in this time of communion, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.